Achtung, Achtung, which is, of course, German for warning, warning. An appropriate phrase this week, given that on January the 30th, 1942, 80 years ago, Adolf Hitler made perhaps his most notorious and disturbing speech of the war. He said, we are fully aware that this war can end only either in the extermination of the Teutonic peoples or in the disappearance of Jewry from Europe. Well, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland. When we were talking in December, our December week last year, yeah. Um, the, the thing is, is the thing is, is that's that's very well underway. The, the second half of that by by January the thirtieth, nineteen forty-two, Vanze Conference has happened. Yep. Which after all was postponed because of um, uh, what's going on in Moscow and all that sort of stuff, and so. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's a what what they call a pathwayed decision, isn't it? By this point, they're they're engaged with it entirely. But but I mean, you know, it, it's so typical of of Hitler that he talks in those completely black and white terms. You know, yeah. He's, yeah. We've, we've talked before about him always saying, the you know the the Third Reich is going to be the Thousand Year Reich or it's going to be Armageddon. There's absolutely yeah. no grey area whatsoever. Yeah. And here he is again. Yeah. There's no grey area. There's going to be the extermination of the Teutonic peoples, i.e., you know, white wasp Germans. Or the disappearance of all um, yeah. Jews in Europe, and neither was true, um, yeah. which just goes to show how much he got wrong in his comparatively yeah. short political although, career. Although, he, I mean, the thing is, is his effort to make the second part of it happen is is key. Is is you know, I mean, if you're looking for Nazi war aims, yeah. um, uh, if it, you know, if you're ever ever wondering what on earth they're doing it for, here it, here it is. Um, uh, from the guy, from the guy in charge, and it's. I've just been watching the um, that Storyville uh, documentary. Although Storyville is the it's the BBC's name for its strand of documentaries that it buys, it yes. tends to be um, called Final Account, which is um, film from twenty twenty of a of a guy called Luke Holland. Actually, yeah. the director's yeah. called Luke yeah. Holland. Yeah. Well, it's downloaded he, onto my iPad. Yeah, and he died just after he made it. But he went. He basically went round interviewing as many old 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 Germans as he could get his hands on. And it's it's extraordinary, you know. It's people joining the Hitler Hitler Youth at sixteen said I did it so I didn't have to do any labour. You know, that's the reason I joined. All this sort of stuff. And then and there's an amazing bit with an old boy, and they're talking about burning down synagogues. And he says, "Well, it didn't didn't mean anything to me. It didn't bother me." And then the interviewer says, "But yeah, but it was a crime." He says, "Well, hold on a minute, a crime? Yeah, I suppose I suppose it was a crime. Yeah, I mean, destruction of someone else's property that." That's a crime, you know. Uh, whatever way you look at it, that is a, yes, that is a crime. And but but that but that he's being basically pushed into having to see it like that, rather than oh, I didn't give a shit. But it's it's really interesting. But, but he the, clearly because, didn't give a shit, and he hadn't really. Well, exactly. About it well, that's what's so interesting is he's, is they're being honest about that. They're saying, "Well, I was sixteen. I didn't care about that." And then there's a, there's a, another woman. Well, you going, don't when you're sixteen, though, do you? Well, but that's but that's what's so interesting, isn't it? That's what's so interesting. That's what's such a part of it and one woman going well you know these people weren't in our neighborhood so it didn't affect me you know and this sort of and that you know where well, they weren't they weren't ethnically uh sound were they so you know but they weren't in my neighborhood so it didn't so it wasn't anything to do with me it's just interesting that just just i mean that that he's been able to get people to talk like that and be sort yeah. of honest about how they felt is really is really was really really fascinating i, I mean i recommend it to anyone but it's it's um Hard, hard, you know, hard hitting, is it? It's, 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 yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's tough because you're right. When you're 16, you don't care about those things, and maybe you ought to. You know, is is possibly part of the part of the message of it is, uh, you know. And if you if you if you're 16 and you can't tell that that's wrong, you know. And there's one old guy going. Any, there's one old guy going. Ah, oh, we didn't really know what was going on in the concentration camps. And then the next interview, he's going. Anyone who says that is lying. They are mm. lying. Everyone knew. Um, and because and he says, you know, people go, people come to work in their concentration camp uniforms, you know, because if you're on a on a sort of work release thing. So he said they were everywhere. So you'd see these people, you knew who they were and you knew what was going on. But you could, can you not can you not sort of sweep that under the carpet in the same way that, you know, I mean, everywhere in Britain, there were prisons of war who were working on the land. And, and well, I suppose that. I suppose I mean, this is what's so interesting is 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 watching the rationalizations and thinking, are they are they doing this because they've been brainwashed by the Nazis, or is this because this is how people think? These are the rationalisations people are able to make, and and obviously a big part of it is they've all been absolutely convinced that Germany is facing, uh, uh, you know, like that speech 
like that Hitler quote that that they're it's shit or bust that they're facing one you know it's us or them literally is what they're being told. Well, they're, they're, they're Germany told has faced that, this yeah. great emergency and and they believe it you know they they do believe it and they also believe that you know it's also a totalitarian state so let's not make any yeah. any you know I mean you know if you don't go along with it you're in you're well going yes to but, do, but, aren't you exactly well exactly but it's it's about gradations of participation isn't it is it, we, we, are you are you enthusiastically for the totalitarian state because it's rewarding you or makes you feel good and all those sort of and all those gives you a swanky things. uniform when you've or, all or, had yeah, no exactly. bloody shoes to put on your feet exactly or is it or is it that you think you better keep your head down but then you've got people saying so i joined the ss you know you, you had to keep your head down so i joined the ss well mm. <laughs> you know i mean it's it's really fascinating. But and, why and do kids inc- join gangs? You know, why, why do you join well, a gang well, in South London well, or in, uh, in the exactly. Bronx or whatever? Exactly. It's for a or, sense of or, belonging, for being part of something, for having... But because but that's actually also why, you want the authority. But that's also why people join village cricket teams, isn't it? Because they want to be part of a gang, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's only one step removed from joining the SS. <laughs> no, being but, a member but, of I mean, Chalk Valley Cricket Club. <laughs> but this is what's so interesting about all of this, isn't it? Is that, is that um, there are all sorts of reasons for yeah. doing things. And the Nazis, the Nazis are very, very good at... I mean, what's evident from watching this is they, they were very, very good at tugging on people's heartstrings and very, very good at getting them involved and very, you know, really, really brilliant at it. Is, is yes. the, and also brilliant, so brilliant at it that 80 years later, people are still coming up with their rationalisations and Well, and also, I mean, think, think, of, and, think of people that follow, I don't know, QAnon or something. Yeah. You know, there's, there's plenty of people in the world who really, really believe that. And, yeah. and, th- and their propaganda efforts are considerably less effective, or I would say accomplished, than those yeah. of Goebbels and co at the propaganda ministry yeah. in the Third yeah. Reich. I mean, yeah, the other yeah. thing is, you know, you only have to think about it the other, you know, what, what was that? I mean, th- that bloke who was stabbing to death his former girlfriend in the street yeah. the other day. Yeah, yeah. Most yeah, yeah, people yeah. stood around watching yeah. and let it happen. One bloke drove into him of his car. But yeah, I mean, over, yeah. the, the point is an awful lot of people... Either you embrace it or you don't embrace it. If you don't embrace it, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so. In, it, I, I would. I would say it. It. it, it it's something you really. Need, you really need to. You know that. I, I mean, our regular listeners will, will probably go and watch this anyway. But it's really, really fascinating. You. You've seen Munich, haven't you? You've, you've done yeah, it. Yeah, I have. I, I was sort of braced. I was expecting to kind of not really like it and kind of sit there getting annoyed. Um, I mean, first first scenes of, of Berlin, it's like no trams, yeah. far too many cars, they're all too clean, right. you know, all that kind oh, of stuff. Usual, usual oh, thing yeah, of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. people putting far too much traffic in any German scene. But apart from that, I thought it was rather good. I mean, it was tense. I mean, I like the novel, though. And I suppose the other thing yeah. is, is that I'm broadly um, simpatico with Robert Harris's view on Chamberlain and the whole Munich deal. I, I, you, yeah. you know, I know this all sort of... Um, prompt sort of sharp intakes of breath from from someone like Tim Bouvery, who's who's quite hard on Chamberlain. Yeah, but yeah. I actually think Chamberlain didn't really have any much choice in the matter. And all things considered, well, I mean, you know, there's so many factors going into play with the with the Munich Agreement at that particular time. I mean, no one wants war apart from Hitler. Yeah, you know, German generals don't want war. Mussolini doesn't want war. The French don't want war. British don't want war. Czechs obviously don't want war either. Uh, you know, Czech- Czechoslovakia did interestingly have a have a a little entente deal with um, I think it's Roma- it's certainly Hungary and, and maybe Romania yeah. or Poland or something. Poland mobilizes troops and sort of takes over border positions in Lithuania. Um, Hungary incurs into southern Czechoslovakia. Yeah, and everyone everyone sort of forgets all that. No, no um, one want, no one no one is interested in Czechoslovakia coming. No out one's interested in Czechoslovakia apart from uh, Czechoslovakia. A Czechoslovakia is a new country, so you know, from a sort of if you're Britain or France at that time, that sort of gives it only a kind of sort of limited legitimacy. It does give it legitimacy. I'm under, that's not fair, but you know, it's not quite the same as sort of incurring on, you know, doing an incursion into Western, Eastern France or something, mm. or. I don't know. Well, only More because only, and, and then, well, only well, only because France is a superpower and, and yeah, Czechoslovakia yes, isn't. Yeah, of course, I mean, you know, and and your borders are your borders, and and that's standard in you know international law and all the rest of it. But but psychologically, it's a new country. It was part of the Austrian Habsburg Empire. Well, it's and it's part of the discredited 
post-war vs ideal isn't it so so it stands it stands for that um yes. and after all uh, british british politics has has talked itself into being profoundly ambivalent about the vs ideal yes um, you know all don't that. let's be beastly to the germans and all that i mean it's yeah uh, yeah go on but go on go on because i've not seen well the film, the, anyway. the, well and the, and the, and the other the other point of course is is that so Dayton-Land is predominantly German and, and was part of, you know, large parts of it were part of Germany. So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of issues that if you're Britain and France and you're kind of wanting to find reasons not to go to war, yeah, Czechoslovakia is quite a hard one to sell. And of course, the bottom line is, is that, that in Britain, 92% of the population are against going to war in 1938 over Czechoslovakia. It's yeah. a similar number in France. And there isn't a single democratically elected leader anywhere in the world. Then or today, that would go against the wishes of 92% of the population. It's just not going to happen. And not only that, the Chiefs Imperial General Staff have said not possible. They've said not possible. There's absolutely no question. So he's taken ad- so, so he's taken advice. He's taken the, you know, the expert military advice is whatever you do, don't do it, which is very interesting because very often expert military advice can be, yeah, we can do that if you want, boss, because after all, people, you know, want to um, justify their existence. As, you know, yeah. it's like you look at you look at Afghanistan with the army saying you use the infantry battalions or lose them. You yeah. know, uh, y- y- they're not doing that. They're going, no, nope, not possible. Can't do this. And yeah. that, after all, is because of baked in. That's the 10 year rule, which was devised by Winston Churchill. Yes. Let's not forget. Yes. If, we, if, we, if we're looking at the, you know, the currents of British politics, is I mean, it's all very well. Churchill being an anti appeaser in 1937, 38, 39. But he was. King of the king of the um, anti-war crew, immediately post First World War, wasn't he? You know, the yeah. ten-year rule is Churchill's idea. Comes from Churchill. You know what I mean? So the, the you know the, obviously it's it's politics. So ironies abound anyway. But yeah, he was he was taking he was taking advice. Chamber. He was acting on the advice he had. He wasn't doing anything crazy. Yes, and 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 I think also, and you know, when you look at those letters to his sisters and all the rest of it that you know that he was keeping, which is effectively his. A, a sort of proxy for his diary you know it's absolutely clear that he is desperate to maintain peace you know yeah. he doesn't want to be the british prime minister that leads britain back into war you know less than a you know barely a generation since the last slaughter and and you know you you completely understand that and i think there is some there's a certain amount of, sort of real politic going on here and you also have to remember that it is mussolini who brokers the deal and obviously he's a fascist dictator he's hitler's ally and he's going, making it absolutely clear that Italy doesn't want to go to war at this point. And that does deter Hitler. I mean, that's why Hitler doesn't, does come to the kind of the talks table um, yeah. in Munich is because of pressure from Mussolini, who he still kind of respects greatly. And that's a good sign from Britain because Britain's going, mm, you know, even dictators aren't particularly keen on going to war. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that suggests that there is a hope. Um, and if this is, you know, and... and you know, at that point, from a British point of view and a French point of view, you're thinking, well, the Versailles Treaty wasn't probably quite as good as it could have been. But, you know, mistakes were made. You know, there are Germans in Sedate and You can see how you can sort of persuade yourself that kind of, you know, you've got to stand up to bullies and you shouldn't let yeah. Hitler get his way and all the rest of it. But, you know, Hitler's Hitler's interest seems to be in territories which have no interest to Britain, really, and have well, no impact. And, and, and also, what he's able to do is because this i mean after all sudetenland the, the the name sudetenland is a, is a is a is a nazi party invention there was mm. no they they create the idea of the sudetenland yeah. that area is ethnically german but it wasn't known as the sudetenland no. until until it's until the nazi party start cranking up this idea but what he's playing to is the idea of self determination of peoples isn't he which after yeah. all is a principle that everyone's signed up to as a result of the versailles treaty so it's very very hard to to go well, you know, we, we 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 can't accept that you want those Germans as part of Germany, because ethno nationalism is actually central to the idea of um of the Versailles Treaty, isn't it? That you, you, you know, it, it, it absolutely is. And so, so it's very, very, very hard to argue with if you're if if you signed up to Versailles twenty years previously. Yeah. That 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 or not even not even twenty years previously. That's what's that's you know that's the that's also part of the bind he's got the. He's got the uh, British and French governments in. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's not it's not dissimilar to the to um, something going on right now uh, <clears throat> in another faraway country of which we know very little. You uh, know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, no, the, the parallels are extraordinary. Uh, I mean, 
you know the other the other fear for Chamberlain, which I think most people I've, I've rarely seen ever mentioned, of course, is is that China is a year into its war yeah. with in in China, is yeah. clearly threatening British um, and uh, imperial hegemony in the Far East and Southeast yeah. Asia, and has got friendly overtures with with Nazi Germany too. They haven't signed a yep. sort of, a, you know, haven't joined the Axis. That doesn't happen until September the 30th, 1940. But but even so, they're kind of, you know, you, you, the last thing you want to do is then sort of encourage, is get embroiled in a European war and with your back turned, encourage the Japanese to then start, you know, in, making incursions onto British territory in the Far East. You know, one yeah. of the big concerns for, for, for Chamberlain is that any European war with Nazi Germany will bring about the end of the British Empire and, and be financially ruinous to Britain, just as it's emerging yeah. out of the Great Depression. And on both yeah. facts, he was frankly completely right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, because that's exactly what did happen. And Chamberlain, after all, has been Chancellor of Exchequer, so has that head on. Well, he's it, been Chancellor of not... Exchequer since 1931. So well, he's exactly. lived through so, the Great Depression. So, so he knows all about it. So, it's, uh, you know, that's... That's his. That's his department, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing. The thing again to remember about Chamberlain is he's not just he's not just this sort of bloke who messes up his foreign policy. Is he? He's, he's, he exists in a complete political. As a, you know, after all, he knows what it's going to cost to rearm, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, if it comes to it, and after all, is involved in you know very much involved in rearmament by the time this starts getting underway. The spending's on the up already because the British have realised that. They're going to have to. I mean, it's yes, because it's not one, one thing. Sorry, I mean, right, yes, what is so absolutely one. not the case here is is it's not appeasement and not and, and a lack of rearming. The two don't go hand in hand at all. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not yeah, yeah. you know they are rearming. They're just delaying war as long as they possibly yeah. can. And yeah, yeah. you know, I I still think that was the right decision to make in 1938. I mean, it's it, yeah. it's. You know, so, so someone said, "What would have happened if we'd gone to war then?" Well, you know, I don't know because it didn't happen. But, but well, you know, but but also in a way, in a way, what Hitler, what Hitler really needs is that war in thirty eight because the British aren't ready for it, and the longer you give the British to get ready, although obviously, obviously, so much of this goes through the prism of what happens in the summer of nineteen forty, because if the summer of nineteen forty had yeah. gone differently and you had got the stalemate war that the British and the French were hoping for, you don't get the collapse of France and all that sort of stuff. This might, this may all look very, very different. It's not just what if Hitler go, what if Chamberlain goes to war in thirty eight. It's what if, what if, Case Yellow doesn't work out, and the yeah. Germans don't clear, achieve their rapid blow. You know, is Chamberlain right to have delayed, or should he have delayed? For, you know, is, does that make that yeah. does that change going to war in Poland for for Poland in thirty nine? That changes that. It's I, I think so much of it. We look we look at so much of this through the prism of May 1940. Because after all, that's how you can write guilty men and go, they didn't take this seriously, they didn't arm us properly, they didn't get us ready for war. You, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. so much of it. If you, uh, and we've, we, we're forced to look through that perspective because so much of the historiography comes from stuff like guilty men. Churchill, yeah. Churchill saying, see, I was right all along, as, as his <laughs> yes. way of, you know. And after all, Churchill's covering his tracks because the ten-year rule is Churchill's. You know, you, 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 the, the absolute fundamental root problem with rearmament or being ready or being sufficiently, de you know, able to deter Germany it, uh, uh, it lies. You know, of course he's trying to throw people off the scent. I mean, is, is Jeremy Irons a convincing Chamberlain though? You, you, yes, he's you feel his good. turmoil. I think he, I mean, he sort of slightly overcooked the kind of sort of, I know I may look silly in the long run, but if that sort right. of, you know, if I look <laughs> silly because, uh, but, and I've, I've, you know, staved off war and that means ultimately we're going to win, then I don't mind looking a fool, you know, the greater good. And, all that and I think, I think, think Chamberlain was a much more um, preening and, and sort of, uh, um, had a, a greater sort of puffed up view of his own. Yes being and self than, than Jeremy Irons. But I, I thought Jeremy Irons was rather good as Chamberlain. I mean, it's interesting because overnight, overnight I had, a, I had a, uh, an email from a student in America and he was saying, what were the short-term and long-term um, consequences of the Munich Agreement? Well, short-term consequences that war was delayed for 11 months. Long-term consequences were that war, war then happened. Um, um, France fell. Britain, <laughs> Britain won the Battle of yeah. Britain. Um, Hitler went into the Soviet Union earlier than he yeah, was yeah, planning yeah, yeah, to, yeah, and he yeah, lost yeah. the war. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, you got to put it back that way. But yeah. I enjoyed it. I thought it was good, and the, the, all the leads were fantastic. And 
um, and it was tense. And, his, and and the plot of a back channel isn't really that 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 that's not really something that happened, is it? Where there's no, it didn't German... happen at all. It didn't happen at all. But it but it it's it's very, you know, it, it works as a, as a conceit because it has yeah. no consequences. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, the, the guy doesn't shoot Hitler. The only thing that was that was faintly unnerving was the moment Hitler came in. I thought, God, I've seen that bloke before. And then I went, oh, yeah, he was Goebbels in Downfall. Yes, he, he's Goebbels so he's in Downfall, switched. isn't he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he looks, he still looks working like Goebbels his way in round the night, Working his way round the top brass. <laughs> yeah, the chap who was Mussolini was very, looked very Mussolini-esque, although I don't think he opened his mouth. Um, and, and Goering sort of looked fat and jolly and sort of laughing a lot. Um, so he looked good. Um, the chap who played Hitler, was, it was just, it was literally the worst bit of casting ever. Um, but... <laughs> But there was this brilliant bit where he's confronting with the confronted with the young would be um, um, op- German opposition guy, mm. and um, it's brilliantly tense. And he just looks at him with these piercing eyes, and this guy's got his pistol in his hand. And he could shoot Hitler there and then. And um, it, it's really it's really good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. And I was sort of I was looking for sort of you know um, um, lines where you sort of think yeah, I never have said that in nineteen thirty eight. Um, but I didn't pick up any particular house. So there's no one saying DM me or um, I'm vibing that. Or any of that yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. You know, you totally cancel him, right? You know, <laughs> anything like that. Hitler's cancelled. He's just cancelled, you know. Yeah, uh, there's nothing like that. So, uh, no, I thought it was good. And I've also had, I've had the most amazing um, thing. So, so one of our listeners, a chap called Paul Dobeck uh, from the US, um, emailed me out of the blue. Well, maybe yeah. just emailed the We Have Ways Gmail. I don't know. Anyway, it, it, it wound up in my inbox. He said, um, I know these guys over here who've got um, this amazing diary of this German soldier um, right. on from the Eastern Front. Um, you know, and we don't know quite what to do about it. And it's all in German. And, you know, what do you think? And I went, so I emailed back and said, God, this sounds fascinating. So suddenly there was this sort of whole bunch of people involved. And so last night I had a Zoom of them all. So I had a put of really? Zoom and Andrea and, and Harold in Germany and Ramo, who is Harold's cousin, but lives in America. Uh, right. And we were talking about Harold's father, who was Harold Lerndorf Sr., who had served right. in the 58th Infantry Division in the Wehrmacht right. from 1940 right through to pretty much the end of the war. And he was a dispatch rider on a motorbike. Right. So he went through the whole France campaign... Yep. Was then in Army Group North, heading up towards Leningrad. Yep. Wounded, ended up, I think, having recovered, then going into a different um, infantry division at the end of the war, so that he was in southern Germany and was captured by the Americans at the end of the war. Right. Right. Wow. And was then a prison war. Anyway, he, Harold Jr. in Germany showed me the four diaries that his father kept. So there they are, you know, one, two, three, four, labelled. And before he, so some time ago, they, Harold and his siblings asked their father if he would write them up. Yeah. So he typed up his diaries. So the diary bit entries are in bold and then put his yeah. comments in non-bold right. font. Right, 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 right. Anyway, wow. they promised to send them to me, um, plus a whole load of photos. There's a photo album as well of this guy's experience incredible in the eastern front and he survived the whole thing i mean one of the very very few to yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know be standing Amazing. in 1940 and still standing in 1945 just about Absolutely so it'll be incredible. very very interesting to see what the content is but you know yeah. it's just that it's that immediacy isn't it of a diary you know that, that yeah. it was written then at that particular moment on that particular yes. day there's no hindsight and, it's what it was and, and then not, and not written to reassure a sibling or a parent or any of that stuff too no you know, so you you you, it's much much li- less likely to have been varnished, as it were, in the writing. Right. So I'm really intrigued to see what it's going to be. We've got to sort of try and get it translated. But brilliant, you know. excellent. Well, we need to just take a brief break. We'll be back in a second uh, with more war waffle. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and James Holland, of course. Um, uh, now, um, now, I just want to do some parish notices, Jim, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Now, a reminder that if you'd like to come to our Second World War-themed festival, oh yeah, 
this summer. It takes place <laughs> over the weekend of July the 22nd to the 24th near Silverstone Racecourse in Buckinghamshire. You can hear the Ferraris in the background if you're lucky. Loads of military <laughs> vehicles, tanks, guns and lots of talks and brilliant speakers. Go to our website for ticket information. That's we have ways pod. We have ways pod dot com slash festival. Um, uh, at, on this Thursday's podcast, we've got uh, Gajendra Singh on the extraordinary Indian uh, effort in the war, which is fa- fascinating, and not just and on both sides. So we talk about the INA as well as um, mm-hmm. as well as the Indian Army, which I think is really really interesting. Super Chandra bows and all that. Yeah, all that stuff. And on Sunday, we've got more of your family stories, which is I'm very excited about. Um, I I'm a friend of mine. I went for a pint on uh, Saturday with a friend of mine, um, and we got talking about Midway. Yeah. And he sent me, he sent me a thing. Someone's done, there's a very, it's long, but there's a really interesting thing on YouTube of midway from a Japanese perspective, right? So huh. it's what it, so basically it's all the stuff they're doing in, to look for the Americans while they're approaching midway. And, you know, there's one, there's one of the, they send a load of scout planes out to cover 176,000 square miles of ocean, right? Yep. And one of them leaves 20 minutes late and it, that's the plane that um, sees the first American signs of the Americans, right? Amazing. And had it left on time, it would have seen them sooner. And that might have changed things in the course of the battle. And what you get wow. is from the Japanese perspective is he presents the sightings of the Americans as they're seen in real time. So you, he doesn't know what they, so you've got to, it's assessing what they are. And, oh, whether, have to watch that. and, and the emphasis on that of like, you don't know that, um, that the Americans are just going to keep doing lots and lots of piecemeal attacks. You don't know that. So every attack, you think this is the one. And you don't you don't know because no. you can't know because the information you're receiving as you receive it has no, you've no conception of what's happening on the other side of the hill, as it were, and what they're sending to you and how they're, how they're doing it. And it's it's really, really, really well done. And that whole thing of when the, the Japanese decide to do, um, you know, to wait to, to do an attack on mass because that's doctrine, right? Of course they decide to, to, you know, it's always, you know, it's not a mistake. It's the way they do things to, yeah. for concentration of force. It's not a mistake. It just turns out to be the wrong thing to do. Right, right, right. That's so interesting. Well, I've got to, do, I've got to write a TV script about Midway. So um, ah. I wouldn't mind a link to that. I'll send, I'll send it over. It's absolutely, it's yeah. brilliantly done. I mean, it's, it, uh, uh, and it, and it's long and it go and it really goes through, it goes through the stuff in, in, in sort of, proper sort of dissected detail but but the emphasis is on as you see the thing appear you know you hear from a spotter plane you know because they, they go back they, they think they 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 mistake the yorktown they think the yorktown's like three different aircraft carriers so they, every time they see the yorktown they put it down as another aircraft carrier rather than it's it's the same one right so there's only one there to deal with and they don't they they they, they cut they, they get that wrong you know, and so he's right. making decisions based. They're making decisions based on wrong information, uh, uh, but understandably arrived at. It's really, really well done. And just that idea That's of amazing. you, you until you, you don't know, you don't know what's coming. You don't know that it's just some Hellcats, you don't, or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, You yeah, don't yeah. know. You know, and obviously you wait until you can do your attack the way you do your attack because that's what works. Because you've got the best pilots and the most experienced people and the best kit. In the theatre, by a yep. long way. You know, you've yep. got the absolute cream of the crop. So you want to use them in concentration rather than... Well, mid- Midway is just such a remarkable battle. It, it is because, it, you know, it's it's when the Americans, who are you know, obviously an, ex- an incredibly strong Navy by 1942 yep. standards, but they're still not... They're, they're a long way from their kind of, you know, their zenith. They're totally it, green. It, it, they're totally it's green. The- and and they're taking on the Japanese who probably are at their zenith. And yeah, yeah, you know the fact that they come out the other side um, victorious is 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 such a game changer. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's a remarkable, it's an absolute remarkable victory. Just six months after after D Day, or just yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. Pearl Harbor rather. Seven Pearl months Harbor. after yeah. seven months yeah. after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. You know, so it's a it's an extraordinary game changer. And really, for for drama, it just. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to beat it, isn't it? It's um, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. well. You know that 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 attack, the, the, the American attack that only they only only one torpedo, the entire squadron's destroyed. One torpedo is launched that misses, and that that ensign Gay is the only bloke who survives. You think the, the the sheer just the sheer sort of like you say the sheer drama of that. Yeah. Um, 
you know, you can't really can't really beat it. It's it's, it's extraordinary. But I'll send that to you because it's really worth watching. Because because of that emphasis on the thing, you know, um, uh, that you don't know. We know what the Americans are doing. When we tell the battle, we know we know what the Americans are doing. We, we know, know about those four doing. minutes. Exactly. But you take that out. Yeah. And every time the Japanese see something, what they've got to assess it. They've got to weigh it up. They've got to decide what it is. They've got to... And then they've got to... With it, then within their doctrine, they've got to make a decision about what to do. You know, it's not like they're going to suddenly change their doctrine. You know, especially mm. as the idea is to bring the Americans to battle. That is the idea is to is to have this battle that they're having. You know, uh, it's 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 really really good. It's really good. Oh well, I'm definitely going to watch that. I've also been doing some work on the on the Philippines, the the the, um, oh, yeah. uh, the American sort of uh, reconquest of the of the villa or, or liberation, depending on which way you look at it. Yeah. Um, uh, of the Philippines and sort of <laughs> MacArthur's return and all the rest of it. Yeah. So I've been sort of getting my really getting my head around all the different islands and 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 all the rest of it. Um, but the Luzon um, attack, the island on which Manila sits, obviously, and um, yeah, and and the main airfields and stuff, is it's fascinating because obviously. The kamikaze attacks have just started. And MacArthur completely, totally ignores the intelligence briefing on Yamashita. Yamashita is, the, you know, the Tiger of Malaya. Yeah. And yeah, I suppose he's he's the sort of Japanese Rommel. You know, he, he's beloved by his men for the most part. He's not seen yeah. as quite as sort of brutal as others. Although I think, again, you know, I'm not sure. That yeah, that, it's all that, relative, that, isn't it? It's all relative. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think he was quite quite hard. But he he's definitely more kind of Zen-like than a, than a lot of Japanese generals. Um, yeah. And he was a brilliant military commander. The fact there is absolutely no question whatsoever. And, and yeah. all the intelligence briefings coming from, um, uh, from Kruger's sixth army are that... There's 260,000 Japanese troops on Luzon. Yeah. Um, MacArthur decides there's only 158,000 or 170,000, whatever it is. But, you right. know, basically 100,000 less. And it doesn't matter what anyone says. He's not... It's, he's How like, does la, he la, la, arrive at this decision? This. Just, just because. Intuition. Intuition, because right. he's MacArthur. Right. Uh, and because he doesn't want anyone to put him off doing this attack you know he's like i've right. got to do it i said i'll be back i'm going to be back no one's going to put me off i'm not going to have any kind of you know admiral king kind of sort of telling me not to bother with philippines yeah. until the war's over yeah. it's not a sideshow this is a matter of kind of personal pride i've got to get in there and if yeah. lots of american people get killed then it's just tough yeah uh, and, and you know he's a really quite despicable character <laughs> has to be said anyway the kamikaze start in you know whenever it is november 1944 and uh, on the invasion, on the invasion force um, coming in towards um, t towards Luzon, the kamikazes target the warships rather than the troop ships and support vessels. So it's a bit really? like, yeah. Why? Well, because the idea, if you knock them out, then the others are undefended, and then they're easy meat, I suppose. I guess. But but, but so they go. They're, they're not the of... immediate. They're not the immediate problem, are they? Though that, that, you know. No. So that's it's a, so that's a that's a misguided tactic, obviously. Yeah. But but you know it's a large number of ships which are sunk and hit, and you know badly damaged. I mean, r really, you know, prohibitively yeah. large number of, of vessels that are hit by kamikazes, and everyone's thinking, yeah. God, if this goes on, you know, we're absolutely stuffed. We just can't. This is totally unsustainable. And then literally, you know, they land on whatever it is, you know, on Luzon on the ninth of I think it's ninth of January, nineteen forty-five, and then so soon after, the, the kamikazes just stop, and everyone's like. What you know? How, why are the Japanese stopped? And it's because they've got they've literally run out. Really? Yeah. They've used them all up. Pretty much. They've got like fifty so, left, and they suddenly think, "Crikey, we've only got fifty left around here. We need to save speaks, those." For the kind of speaks to the weakness of the strategy, doesn't it? Of the tactic, rather. Doesn't I it? Mean... Just. So, which is why the Luzon invasion is 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 sort of able to go ahead, and and you know it's a, more successful than it might otherwise have been. Amazing! It, it is absolutely amazing, and everyone's really panicking. And it, 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 when I was sort of boning up on all this, I was sort of well. We haven't had um, um, Tammy Davis Biddle on on the podcast yet. No, well, it's been broadcast. But it was reminding me of, of of what she was saying about yeah how actually in 1945, you know, retrospectively, um, you know, we 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 can all agree with Phillips Payton O'Brien that, that the strategic earthquake in Pearl Harbor, and, you know, and it's all kind of preordained and all the rest of it. But if you're Eisenhower or if you're kind of, I don't know, Ernest King or, or Nimitz or, or whatever, or Montgomery, 
in the end of 1944, beginning of 1945. Your view is going to be pretty different, isn't it? I mean, that con- uh, that conversation we had with, with Tammy, st- I mean, I don't want to talk too much about it because people haven't heard it yet, but um, a lot of that has really stayed with me. And, me um, too, really I has. mean, uh, particularly the, the sort of, and I didn't express it very well when we were talking about it in the uh, uh, with her, is that by December of 1944, you're basically at square one. You're back to the German border, which is where you were in May 1940. It's square one. So it has taken you four years of hard fighting all over the world. To get to back get to where back, you were. To get back to where you were in the first place. On the 9th of May 1940. At, on the 9th of May 1940. And what the Germans haven't done is got the message that wherever you, wherever they go in the world, they will be destroyed. Yeah. They haven't got that message. And now, obviously, they're not fighting for North Africa or Italy or France anymore. They're fighting for Germany. And you're, you are literally at square one. Yeah, and the sons of bitches haven't got the message. No, and and the, 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 the you know, and also it took it took four years of the First World War to be stuck at square one permanently. At that, basically, you know, give or take the same situation. So, are you now? Have you now got four years of this to go? And that's well. That's and, actually, and, and, well. Have a look at the Japanese empire. Have a look at the Japanese yeah. empire in, let's say, June nineteen forty-four. Yeah, because so that is also really good, because it's still absolutely it's, it's enormous. enormous. Yeah. Okay, so what's gone? Yeah. What's now back yeah. in in Allied hands? Well, the Solomon yeah. Islands. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Northeast India has no longer got you know. Well, it still has in June. Yes, exactly. Well, exactly. Yes, it's still Japanese in Northeast India, yeah. Malaya, yeah. Burma, Singapore, yeah. uh, um, Indochina, and don't forget that in uh, when is it February nineteen forty four? The Japanese launch Operation Ichigo, which yeah. is another major offensive in China, yeah. and that's because the B twenty nines are coming, and they don't want the um, they want to kind of block off southern china airfields to the americans yeah. and so they do this drive from the coastal areas of central southern china all the way down to indochina you know what is now vietnam yeah to deny it to the americans so that's a major offensive as well so actually in terms of territory their territory has increased by june 1945 44 not decreased and frankly yeah. by January 1945 is still not that much smaller. You know, yeah. the China bits are still in, in Japanese hands. Well, this is it, isn't it? So so, so you're at square one with Germany and it's cost you all this and you're, and you're not even at, you know, you're, you're, you've played complete snakes and ladders with the Japanese, haven't you? And yeah. You've gone back. So, so, got so very, retrospectively, you've got like you, can, you can absolutely see it's all over. But, but, but. Yeah. You, you you know, and also by by the time of the Luzon invasion um, uh, on the Philippines in January 1945, it's absolutely clear that the Japanese have no intention whatsoever of throwing in the towel anytime yeah. soon. Yeah. And it's what we've been saying for the last year on this podcast. But but it's really written large and it's really clear that that, you know, everyone is starting to really get kind of very, Everyone's very war weary. Yeah. yeah. And even the Americans who, you know, let's face it, came a little bit later than others. <laughs> but interesting characters as well. I mean, people like Kruger, General Kruger, who's a sixth army commander, um, and Eichelberger. You know, we talked with, with John McManus, didn't we, about Eichelberger. We didn't yeah. really touch on Kruger so much. So Kruger is a German. You know, he's, he's a, his parents are German. He came over to America when he was like eight or something like yeah. that. So yeah. he's got rid of all his German accent, but he was grow, he grew up in a German household speaking German you know, his family is a German. I think his father got an Iron Cross in the First World War or something. Oh, I can't yeah. remember, or his grandfather or something. Um, uh, uh, but, but you know, he's a a really, really interesting character. And he is, yeah. although he's Americanized and American citizen, he is a German. Yeah. yeah. Very straight. And, and really into kind of looking after the men, you know, yeah. and, and all that. You know, his, his, his sort of pastoral care is is really, really good. A bit humorless. Yeah. And he's just this this character, this army commander in the in the U.S. Army that vast majority of people have never even heard of. No. And he's really good. But if Fourteenth Army of the Forgotten Army, the U.S. Army in the Pacific, and and the Philippines are the Forgotten yeah. Army, the Sixth and the Eighth Army, because everyone thinks everyone thinks it's the Marines. <laughs> yeah, because it is. The there is there is the U.S. Eighth Army out there. 
Yeah. They don't, obviously, they don't have the 8th Army in Europe, but they do in Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. But everyone thinks it's the Marines, don't they, Pacific? Yeah. They think it's the US Marine Corps that did it. Simplify. Because they, they've got good PR, basically. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> but that is the bottom line, isn't it? If you've got good PR, you, you're, you're remembered more than if you don't have good Now, who PR. did you say was killed in those kamikaze attacks? Hubert Lumsden. Yeah. Hubert Lumsden. He was on... He was Churchill's personal... Uh, you know, what's it? Not liaison officer, not dip, dip, diplomat. He was his personal man attached to MacArthur's... His eyes and ears. Eyes and ears, yeah. For, for, for Churchill at MacArthur's headquarters. And he cops it... He in, cops in, it in a kamikaze attack, yeah. Herbert Lumsden, on the 6th of January, 1945. There you are, it's the invasion day. Yeah. yeah or, yeah, no, yeah. was it the 6th And he was at Mitterrea Ridge. He was at Mitterrea Ridge, wasn't he? Yes, he was. At the Second Battle of El Alamein. Yeah. 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 And there you go. That's him. Kaput. Yeah. And I mean, who'd have thought it? I never knew. Did you? No, I had no idea. No. So there you yeah, go. On the bridge of USS New Mexico. That's right. Yeah. I mean, Incredible. you know, lots and lots of people died in kamikaze attacks. I mean, really, a, yeah. you know, horrendous number. And lots of quite senior senior officers as well, because but, they I just mean, go it's straight sli- into it. it it, it's slightly different, but if you think if 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 the Germans had had the nous to use the v the v ones, um, uh, I mean we've talked about this before to, to try and destabilise um, the Overlord beachhead. Know, you know, it's amazing, isn't it? It's just amazing how weirdly sort of stupid the Germans they were. They have that they have that weapon, and yeah. then they don't they don't use it when they could have really. Well, That's yeah, the, yes, you know, and they have, but they have radar and nineteen really good radar, three hundred and sixty degree radar in nineteen forty, and don't use it properly. Yeah, yeah. etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, yeah. I've said it before. I'll say it again. They never focus on. They never prioritize. Lumsden, really. Lumsden was fired, wasn't he? And yeah. Horrocks took his place. That's right. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. the way you look at it, it didn't end well for him. We had a row with Monty. Yeah. Yeah, what what? Yeah, so he had to yeah. go. What what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, do not do not pass go. Do not collect your two hundred pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, we've been right. around the houses on this episode, haven't we? Yeah, I can say yeah, there's lots to talk about. Um, uh, that's we're talking uh, about well, a world war, though, aren't we? Look what I got in the post. Have you seen this? Do you know? Are you familiar? No. With this? Oh no, I've got that one. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Yeah, yeah, I've got that one. Lieutenant Colonel G R Stevens, Fourth Indian Division. Well, I've got a, I've got a fourth Indian division um, air text battle dress. Have you? Yeah, from Italy. There we go. This plan was satisfactory to General Tuker. It avoided his bet noir, the committal of flesh and blood against undamaged field defences. Yes, we've got to do that. We've got to do that episode where we look in the battle of. Um, yeah, um, it's Friday the eight, Bam. the eight eight points you send. Well, and that this is about Casino on February twelfth. He wrote to General Freiburg, and this is eight points about what to do about Monte Casino. Mm. See, I want to go and walk up. I want to go and walk his alternative route. Where he goes over over sort of wide of Monte Castelloni. I've looked at it and I've walked all over Monte Casino, but I haven't actually walked that route to see how easy it would have been. But the thing is about, about that that is is the, the immediate sides coming out of the valley are really steep. You have all these little yeah. gullies and stuff, and you have that absolutely all around casino. But then, as it goes up to sort of Monte Cairo, it, it the slopes actually kind of soften. Then it's not as, as it's higher, but but they're not as full of gullies and things. Yeah. So I think it would have been entirely possible, is my gut instinct. But yeah, yeah. until you oh, tried okay. it, I've just. Uh, Lumsden said of his firing, um, I've just been sacked because there isn't room in the desert for two cads like Monty and me. <laughs> How can you not like him? <laughs> I'm 100% on his side now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic, isn't it? That's brilliant. How well, that's all we've, got time, all we've got time for today. We're back on Thursday with our regular guest show. Um, uh, and Sunday sees us delve into more of your family stories, which are fantastic. Please keep those coming, by the way, because... Um, yeah. They're, they're they're quite extraordinary. Um, uh, we'll see you all again soon. Live cast on the Mondays as usual for our patrons, and a, and also a pair of silver wings is still going on the Patreon. Yeah. Um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much, Cheerio. Ah, oh, she's done a great job. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Cheerio.